Hello and welcome to the Corporate Storytime podcast series. My name is Lucas Robinson, the host of the podcast. On this pod, I'll get the opportunity to talk to ASX company leaders and innovators as they run through their personal executive journeys and the stories behind the companies they are helping to grow today. I'll be leveraging my experience as a former stockbroker and my current role with investor relations consultancy, Corporate Storytime. But enough of that. For now, let's gather around, come in close, and let me tell you a story. Well, hello and welcome back to another edition of the Corporate Storytime podcast. We're joined today by Alcane Resources Managing Director, Mr. Nick Erner. Alcane is a gold producer via the company's Tommingley Gold Operations and is also advancing the very large Boda Kaiser Copper Gold Porphyry deposits with these key assets all located in central western New South Wales. Alcane has been listed on the ASX since 1980 and has a long and outstanding track record of adding shareholder value by applying good geoscience to several exploration and mining projects the company has owned over the years. Nick trades as a chemical engineer and has previously held roles in mining with majors such as Rio Tinto and BHP. He has been with Alcane since 2013 and took over the role as managing director in 2017. Well, thanks for joining us, Nick. Thanks, Lucas. Um, before we get into what's happening here and now with Alcane, maybe you could give us a bit more of an understanding of your background in, in uh, the sector and, and how you found your way um, uh, to the, into the mining sector. Yeah, the long and involved journey <laughs> to get here. Yeah, that's right. Mm, that's an interesting one. I guess the first thing is how did I end up being an engineer and then the second one was, you know, how did I end up doing chemical engineering and then into mining. I guess how I ended up being an engineer, I grew up in northern New South Wales, people are familiar, you know, near Byron Bay sort okay. of but inland on the coast there, <laughs> not Hemsworth country but near as damn it. And, you know, it's always logical that I would go, my family had moved down from Brisbane when I was a young baby. You know, I, I loved doing things, practical things, sports, you know, a lot more hands-on, whether it's because I wasn't in a city or whatever, I don't really know. And so after sort of doing different subjects, you know, I, I did sort of woodwork and stuff like that, I thought, you know, I want to do a hands-on role. So, you know. So to, what, what town were you in when you attended high school? The town's name was Alstonville High School. It's in between Ballina and Lismore. Okay. Yeah. And, um and so I was attracted to hands-on stuff and sort of engineering rose up as, as it. And my grandfather, my mother's father, had been an engineer and my elder sister had gone for civil engineering uh, at university. So it was sort of, you know, open to me to do that. And the family? Yeah, a little bit. And then so I went up to the University of Queensland and did that. And that was in from 1990 to 1994. And that's sort of how I came to be an engineer. I really enjoyed the subjects and and got into it. And I did vacation work down in Wollongong with CRA, as it was at the time, which, of course, some many people would know became Rio Tinto. Um, and then at a sugar refinery and then up at Mount Isa Mines, as so many people did in those years. And then interestingly, of course, we had the recession we had to have in 1990 to 1994. Yeah, Paul Keating yeah. famously coined the phrase. Yeah, just stopping a banana republic. <laughs> that's right. And so... The interesting thing about that was, so I did chemical engineering and I'll come to why I chose that, but only half my year had a job at the end of it. So we were sort of 30-odd graduates, about 15 had a job. Exactly. And it was true for so many of us doing engineering at the time. And you contrast that to now where Mm. you can't get enough of them. Can't get enough of them, right? And so I was open to taking any job I could get. And that was one of the reasons why I chose chemical engineering because I just thought the job opportunities base was much wider than choosing straight mining or minerals processing. But I did minerals processing electives. So at the time, I could have done mining engineering, could have done minerals processing engineering, could have done chemical engineering, could have done environmental engineering. Okay. And I chose chemicals. I thought it was the most broad. And then went, you know, went for a series of interviews and the, and the one that gave me sort of the offer um, – best was CRA working in their aluminium section which was losing money at the time but it was up at Gladstone in central Queensland working in the smelters so I went there worked for that met my wife there and my now ex-wife and, and married and we then moved to following her job after a few years there into the central Queensland coal fields 
okay. where I was doing work for a consultant metallurgist for a few years. And then in the late 90s, we were both hoovered up in the great WMC vacuum cleaner of Olympic Dam expansion when they went from 60,000 tonnes to 200,000 tonnes of copper or 180 or whatever it was. And... Um, Went there and it was so there. you moved to South Australia? Yeah, we moved to Roxford. We lived in, in Roxford Downs. No one really did FIFO in those sites back then. You know, if right. you talk to a lot of guys over here, they were still living in Newman or Parapadu or Dampier or stuff. Um, you know, we lived on site there for and did nearly nine years there. And it was there that I worked in automation to start with and that included like the underground trains some of the first remote loaders the remote blasting and instrumentation so pumps pump systems ventilation monitoring all that sort of stuff in underground but of course all the complexity of that surface at olympic dam and there um one of the managers in the smelter found out that i'd been a production superintendent back in aluminium um and asked me to be the production superintendent of the smelter, which I did after a few years, and then I got promoted from there into being the manager of the front end. And it was a, quite a different role. This BHP's got more managers there now. Was, um, it, was it BHP by that time? No, it was all WMC. Right. And uh, I became the manager of what they call concentrator and hydromet, which was running the SX plants and the mills and all that sort of stuff. And I regularly met with the geologists and mining managers to, you know, scheduling all parcels and all that sort of good, good business. And so, yeah, and then from there, we'd been living there for eight or nine years, had our three kids before um, – before so what was that like living in a, in it's a, great in an outback town it was great yeah it was great I think it really works for you need a critical mass of people but it works for young people at one point we were the highest income average town in Australia yeah, I think I would believe it because you weren't there unless you had a job right and so that was the main yeah, reason there was, there was no, no Stanley no, office there was no no retirees nothing right mm. and we had the highest birth rate per capita in Australia so it was all young people under 35 you know we ourselves were in our late 20s through to early 30s when we were there and so you know a lot of other young families and barbies mm. and four driving and you know we traveled in Adelaide and the wineries a fair bit and all that sort of stuff right so it was, was it was good it changed when BHP came they started to do a bit of fly and fly out stuff and that changed the demographic and so after a year and a half of BHP and all that integration stuff, you know, I looked for opportunities within BHP and external because we were just done. You know, our son was entering primary school and the opportunity that came up was working back in coal for coal and allied in the Hunter. And um, so we moved to live in Singleton and it was like, you know, Singleton's a town of 30,000. It was like, wow, big, big smoke, <laughs> you know. You and so we it. Yeah, lived there for a few years, and I worked at um, one of those one of those mines and looked after um, you know the coal processing plants. There were two, and a rail load out, and then just got involved in all that train logistics and stuff. And so that sort of expanded my interest. And as well as that, for a period of time, the maintenance manager for the heavy vehicle equipment left. To, to, took another job opportunity, and I had to act in that role for I call it six months. It wasn't a terrible amount of time, but I took me even more into maintenance, even though I'd done a lot of Olympic Dam, took me more into maintenance, particularly heavy vehicle maintenance. And then from there, Straits Resources offered me a job as a GM of one of their sites, and then um, I became the COO for them after they split coal out of, of the metalliferous sites and was with them. So that rise and fall of that, you know, um, the Indonesian operation was very difficult and, um, you know, it was a difficult time for the company because we just burnt just that tiny bit too much cash there at the same time as we were trying to expand Triton. And... Um, so Triton Bang, the New South Wales. Yeah, the New South Wales copper uh, mine. That's yep. now in the stable of Eris. Eris, yeah, because Straits almost went into administration. Yeah. Um, I was in a lot of trouble. And then I, I remember it was painfully yeah. in my time at Euros, actually. Yeah, recapitalised and then changed its name to Eris. So it's still the same that's right. original yeah. company. So I didn't yeah. actually, no operation was sold. And then I left them and joined. Um, Did you meet um, Jim there who's, you know, now? Yeah, the CFO. Yeah, yeah. He and, the CFO. we, he and I worked together. We, He and I worked together. Jim Carter. Yep. He'd come back out of, he's the Alcane CFO for Clarity. He'd, he'd come back out of, we were in the same office for a couple of years yeah, mm. in Perth. But it was them, it was them that moved me from the operation in New South Wales to, to Perth as the head office. So I moved in late 2010. And um, it was a good move, you know, like on a personal front, it was 
you know, my son's, he was going to fourth grade, it was fourth school, right? Right. And so, you know, people ask me, you know, do I feel sad that I left the BHPs or the Rios of the world? They can be great organizations to work for, but if you're effective, they'll just keep moving you. You've got, yeah, and you've got to tolerate that. It's very difficult for family, so we can want to do that. Anyway, um, yeah, moved here and, um, but in 20, Started 2013, I left them and then started with um, Alcane a few months later. And we were just at Alcane, just starting, we were half a third of the way through construction of Tommingley. Right. So you've been with Tommingley basically. Yeah, yeah, from the, from the get go. From well, almost get go. I was there just as we let, I, I was part of the final sign off of the open cut equipment hire and tender and stuff, free street stuff. And then I was the COO and then, of course, the next big thing we did it was we did all the environmental studies and sign off for the Dubbo project, which became Australian Strategic Materials. That was at the time like a $1.1 billion project, one of the largest projects to get approved in New South Wales. So there was all the government liaison and all that sort of stuff as well, which I was reasonably familiar with having been in the Hunter Valley Coal and the regulator. And then, um, yeah, and then, you know, Tom and Lee getting that Dubbo project and then spent a lot of time. Ian Chalmers, great guy, very experienced explorationist and managing former director, manager, director. Former yeah. manager, director, still our technical director. He and I, I did a lot of marketing internationally with him, particularly for Dubbo project on the trying to get off take, which is still the conundrum of every rare earths yeah. project in Australia at the moment. So did a lot of years on the road. For that, um, became the end. And for clarity, that's been spun into yeah, Australian in twenty twenty. That was spun into Australian Strategic Materials, which for the Alcane shareholders at the time, um, they received an enormous benefit. Yeah, yeah, because it it was spun out at a nominal dollar thirty, and then it rose all the way up to fourteen bucks. It's back. It's back down now. I think at a dollar ten, but there was a real rise and fall mm. as rare as just surged in um, interest in the late COVID period with a lot of sort of, I don't know, I'll call it the East West Hemisphere sphering of yeah. supply chains. Yeah, and so that's been my career. So it's sort of like an accidental move. Like I'm, you know, I didn't study an MBA and think I wanted to be a managed director one day and like it just sort of happened. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you started, you know, in New South Wales. You went back yeah. there for the job in Singleton and now Alcane's, you know, been drawing yeah. you back there for the last 10 years. Yeah, or- a lot of stuff. Yeah, and we've tried as Alcane to try and pick up assets elsewhere in other jurisdictions unsuccessfully. Um yeah, yeah. And, you know, with Jim and I spent a fair bit of time in Indonesia and other stuff as well. Jim lived there for a while. I, I just travelled up regularly. So, yeah, it's been So, I mean, interesting. and on New South Wales, um, you know, it is obviously a different regulatory environment to mm. what people might be familiar with uh, in the Western Australian context. Yeah. Um, but you've been able to do it successfully in terms of your permitting of, yeah. you know, yeah. projects there, both at Dubbo and Tongley and uh, obviously you've, you've, you've got, you know, a long way down the track with the North Molong Porphyry Project yeah, as, as well. well. Yeah. Yes. So how do you um, describe the, the, the regulatory framework that well, you deal with there? It's not... It's time consuming, but it's not too bad. So there's different, there's different, what are the factors that are different, say, to WA, which many of our listeners will be more familiar with? The first one is farming and landholder density, right? So if you look in the central west where we are, so Dubbo's a four and a half hour drive, you know, four and a half, five hour drive, sort of northwest ish, north northwest ish. Um, of Sydney. Of Sydney. Yeah. yeah. So if you go west, you go out through Bathurst and then you sort of hit orange and then you sort of head northwest and you're up to yeah. Dubbo. And Actually, the, the Robinson clan are from Forbes. Yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah. And there are still Robinsons, there's, um, who, uh, but it's a um, family name of one of the major um, Indigenous families that live at Peak Hill as well, like okay. other uh, Robinsons. So I've got no doubt that there's some connected <laughs> history there. Bush, yeah. So, um, but if you look at that area, so that's um, predominantly where our mine is, which is halfway between Dubbo and Parks. It's predominantly sheep and mixed cropping country. Lowish rainfall, you know, sort of 26 odd inches a year. Um, not remarkable. Get sh- periodic sheep flooding. It's near the Macquarie, but a bit too far to irrigate from. But if you look at that land, you know, land packages. So, for instance, underneath the uh, Tommingley extension project, which is where we're, you know, adding another 10 years to the mine life, that was once seven different farms. 
that we bought out. Um, you compare that to WA, you might have one leaseholder mm. only, and those seven farms will have run, I, c- I can't tell you, but, you know, X thousand sheep and X cropping. But in WA, that would be... Station country. Less, yeah. less, much station country, right? And so that adds complex... With less vegetation. Much less vegetation, yeah. right? And so things like the environmental impact of, you know, mixed grasslands, mixed woodlands, if it's still there, remembering it's all been cleared and broadacre cropped, there's still remnant country, so there's a biodiversity impact of building a mine there. And there's a lot more people to deal with. And in our case, we've got a highway running through the middle, so there's more infrastructure, there's more power, water, road infrastructure to Huge deal with. benefit. Massive benefits to the local community from a um, fiscal perspective, but a lot more negotiation sure. to do. And that's why stuff takes longer in New South Wales, right? It's just more stakeholders. But you compare that to WA, um, in WA... You know, the, the rules around tailing stamps are the same, right? Not the environmental footprint because we've already established there's a difference of impact, but, you know, how they need to be built, stability, leakage, all that stuff is the same. Indigenous heritage stuff is really interesting. It's in WA because there is um, a, a large undisturbed land in stakeholder country, you have a lot more undisturbed Indigenous artefacts, potentially, depending on the location. But absolutely because it's leaseholder land and there's you know land rights claims quite under under law over a lot of that in new south wales it's a real mixed bag a lot of native titles been extinguished because it's been freehold land for so long and it's had the for better or worse you know um disturbance the stuff's been plowed and moved and, and and all that kind of stuff and a lot of a lot of cultural sites remain in and around rivers and things like that, but mostly because they haven't been disturbed by, um, you know, farming activities over the last century. So that actually creates a different dynamic to that issue because you're, tr- you're looking about employment, how do you preserve the heritage that exists, how do you treat it respectfully, realising that much of it has been disturbed. But you do also get European heritage stuff as well, different farmhouses and things. So... When you combine that with the broad view that people in cities prefer to see no impact anywhere on anything, right, that makes the legislative and consultative environment in New South Wales just more time-consuming. Yeah. And um, it, it must be a great benefit to have more people around. I mean, the, the, the FIFO, um, oh, totally. the mining business here totally. in Western Australia, you don't deal with that. We don't deal with that. Now, now I mean, there's one or two roles where people, you just can't get anyone, but um, and that changes depending on the people. But, you know, Dubbo's a town of know, nearly 50,000 now. It's got multiple high schools. You know, heaps of great child zoo. care primary schools, great zoo, second biggest tourist attraction in the West. You know, um, it's got, um, you know, an airport with multiple flights every day in and out of Sydney. Um, it's got places where people's spouses can be employed. It's got a hospital that's serviced by specialists out of Sydney. You know, so it's a kind of place where you're really happy to bring your family and your partner, male or female, is going to be happy there. They're going to get employment. And so, yeah, we get a lot of increased stability of employment as a result of that and lower costs because whilst the salaries are comparable, the on costs are just not the same and nor is the impact on people's life that you have to pay a cost premium for. And I like it on a personal level because, you know, I grew up residentially in my own mining thing and I have, you know, I really enjoyed it at that time, right? Yeah. So I quite like that we're a residential site. But, yeah, it, that is of great benefit. Yeah. Yeah. And so on Tomming Lee, um, production started in 2014. Your first goal was Feb 2014. Open cut stripping started in October 2013, yeah. Yeah. And, well, give us a, a brief sort of production history and, and, and maybe paint a picture of what you, the, the, or the way you see the future. For the yeah, operations. yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the story there goes back a little further in that Alkane, um, you know, having been around for so long, had gold deposits that were identified around Peak Hill, which is to the south of um, the Tommingley mine by about 16 kilometres. And there, um, uh, Alkane ran a or an open cut 
mine with a heat bleach for gold. I only did like sort of 75, 80,000 ounces out of it, but that was sort of more meaningful back then, not a lot of margins back in those days. And in doing so, it did exploration in the region. And in the 2000s, it found um, the what? Wyoming, which is the western deposits for for um, that are now part of Tommingley, and several years later discovered the eastern deposits, the Coloma deposits, and first started sort of raising the idea of developing that in the late two thousands. And at the same time, of course, just as they were putting together that development thing, rare earths went nuts, and they had the Dubbo project running in. Parallel, so they pivoted attention. To not not Dubbo. so much not so much pivoted, but it did slow down a little the development applications because because they were d- okay. you know, divided, and that and then there's a lot of negotiation with the government around what was needed in development applications because no new mines had been approved for quite a while in New South Wales outside of coal, and it took sort of from the 2010 to the 2012 period to land that. One of the things was how many open cuts can you have? Can you have three or four? So a weird thing to get hung up on, but it was an issue that was hung up. Um, anyway, all the required compromises and concessions were made for that and approval was granted in April 13. And on time and on budget, the plant was pouring gold 10 months later. Wow. Mm. We weren't allowed to turn a sod before March 2013. And, and how many ounces are you up to in production now? Oh, Not somewhere, I mean, uh, cumulatively. Could be cumulatively, somewhere around October, November last year, we crossed 600,000 ounces poured. Yeah. And the original reserve at the time, I think we had like 370,000 ounces in reserve when we kicked it off. Mm. And, what, and what's the reserve now? Um, we have, and, and we're increasing those reserves at the moment, but we have, you know, a bit over 700,000 ounces in reserve still. Yeah. Inclu- that now includes these new deposits to the south. So we run the mine. We make a decision to go underground. We, we tossed, were or weren't we going to go underground? We thought, no, we're going to go underground. Originally, we thought we weren't. And we started to wind down the operation. Then we committed to it. We had variable drilling. We had to keep drilling stuff to do that. And um, and we were balancing money with Dubbo Project and what we would do with that at the same time. And then we committed to the underground and we got a lot of success and extensions on that and that kept going. And then by then we'd realised this is going to keep going and we really heavily drilled through 2018 we heavily drilled to the south, it made the discoveries, the continuities of sort of sort of continuities or, or repeats of different load structures and andesite units, depending how you look at it, and um, then just drilled that, have drilled that intensively ever since. First started putting applications in, engaging with government in 20, late 2020, we had our first this discussion. This is for the extension project. The extension project. Yep, and then formally put in our applications in um, a year later, sort of early 2022, and then we got all the different feedback because you can negotiate with all these different departments, you know, water, agriculture, yeah. environment, you name it, right? Um, and then, yeah, that went in, then we got the approval um, in, I think, maybe March last year. Yeah. I and all the different that. leases came out. So, and we made the decision, which was bold, inverted commas, to quote sort of yes, Prime Minister <laughs> or yes, Minister. We made the decision to put an exploration drive from Wyoming's, the southernmost point of the existing mine and underground, all the way down to Roswell, 2.6 kilometres. We made that decision in 2020. Yeah, it's a big drive. It's a big drive. Yeah, we put nearly 30 million bucks into that because you're, you're not uh, digging up any uh, valuable we, no, material. We, we had no idea from a reserve perspective whether we would have a reserve. We thought we would. Yeah. But we, we're very confident in ourselves geologically. We're willing to back ourselves with big programs or, in this case, big development. Yeah. So where are we going with that? Well, finally then we turn this into a substantial resource, you know, uh, several hundred thousand ounces of reserve and you know, one and a half odd million ounces in resource open in all sorts of directions and some incredible intercepts as well. Um, I laugh when I see intercepts here at different companies and people say, oh, wow, you know, it's an amazing intercept. I've got 16 metres at 10 grams. We've published intercepts in that all body. I remember one we published was 80 metres at 9 grams, mm. right? And um, we're going to mine that puppy yeah. in the next 
two years, right? It's going to be phenomenal. And yeah. um, but we're only just doing really tight spaced infill drilling across the next two years, and in the ne- in the coming weeks, we'll you know this is being recorded in well the very end of January, so through February, we'll, you know we'll update that reserve, um, and then we'll continue to upgrade those, right? Um, but yeah, it's it's a very very um, uh, successful story. You know, yeah. this, this is a mine started with a seven year life on at one point during my early months in the country, we, we wondered would we keep construction because gold was correcting down through 1400 Aussie, right? And we'd run our long term numbers at 1450. And we thought, wow, is this going to make money or not? We spent $116 million building it. And, um, yeah, we we it was it was only in 2017 18 that we paid off all of that 116. It was self funded. Yeah, all of that 116 yep. plus um, you know other associated costs along yep. the way, and then everything from then's been upside, and we're in a spending cycle again at the moment. Yeah, so on that spending cycle, um, obviously the last few quarters you've been you know putting money towards uh, the, the extension project. Yeah. Where are you at with that spend and, and when do you come out the other side and start harvesting cash? From yeah, yeah. So, so that spend, we are entering the steep part of spending. So we, we got a lot of spending occurring over the sub, subsequent two quarters, right? So we start to come out of this phase of spending in September when we have a fine grind circuit complete and commissioned and we have a pace plant complete and commissioned. And Because uh, you spent uh, $15.7 million in, in development costs on that asset yeah. last quarter. And that will continue to occur, right? Yeah. You know, we have a $50 million debt facility with Macquarie that, you know, we intend to draw across this either late this quarter, early next quarter Um, because we want to make sure we've got a solid buffer of cash, right, for all obvious reasons. And at the same time, Tommingly is producing cash. Tommingly is producing cash as well. Yeah, that's correct. You know, even last last month where we were milling lower grade because we're balancing waiting for um, Roswell to kick in, you know, we we still even our costs were which were bad by our perspective were twenty two hundred bucks an ounce, mm. excluding the capitalization obviously that's going to Roswell. So, um, and, and you're selling it for you know at times yeah. up above three thousand. Oh yeah, spot obviously. above three thousand. We have our hedge book is around twenty eight twenty five Aussie. Yeah. Right. Um. So, so that the first phase of spending completes itself in set in sort of we'll call it the September quarter. What we have then, though, is the second phase of spending, which is moving the highway and increasing the throughput of the plant. That'll be circa $80 million worth of spending. That, the timing of that is dependent on um, getting tender prices back for the road, what that looks like, the grades we get out of Roswell, what they look like, sequencing of that. Um, engineering lead times and procurement for the throughput expansion. Yeah. So, and I'm talking only months difference here, but will it be a continual ramp of spend and then we'll be out of the whole thing by late 2025? Or will we wait, build some cash, and then draw? I don't have to wait. I don't, I, don't, I don't really know what the most financially but to make astute it, method is of that. To make it clear, you, I mean, the, the guidance for this financial year, uh, financial year 24, is for production between 60 and 65,000 ounces. The investment that you're making on the extension project, hmm. where will that take oh, the, the, the production? So next, next financial year, if Roswell performs as it looks like, you know, I haven't got the updated reserve model yet, but if it looks broadly the way that it, it was as an in mix between indicator and the inferred resource, next year should be about an 80,000 ounce year, next financial year at less cost than this year because the grade's higher, right? Roswell grade is about, as it stands at the moment, hopefully it'll go higher again, about you know, 20 to 30% higher than the existing Tommingly operation. Yeah, it makes a difference. It makes a difference, yeah. And depending if we go through very high grip, it could be higher than that, right? Then, because to be yeah, clear, sorry. Tommingly has got a, um, a, a history of, um, yes. of, of, of 
producing uh, higher grades than what you have in your model. Than what, right? than what we have in the model, yep. And, it, you know, we, we are very reasonable about our just statistics. You know, we've both seen companies really push their models to try and promote a project to get its initial financing and funding. We've never had to do that because we've either been internally funded or, you know, yeah, it's just not how we operate. Um, and so, yeah, we, we we're quite conservative about what we do. Um, and also it's a type of ore body that, you know, it's a it's a narrow vein ore body with different thicknesses and grade pods and all that sort of stuff and that tends to get cut just statistically. It's just the way it is. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, uh, you know, it's, it might be difficult for you to answer, but, you know, come calendar year 26, you know, where do you see the production profile? For, North of 100,000 ounces. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's great. Sometime in all things going smoothly for us, we will stabilise the Roswell Underground. What, what do I mean by that? I mean we're predominantly bringing our ore out of there. We've commissioned the paste plant. And we have paste in our sequence. Everyone listening knows that paste is difficult to add to your sequence. It slows it down. It adds cost. Of course, we've budgeted all that. And we've got a financial pathway that shows how we're going to do the road moving and the open cut and fit everything that we want into that Cool, because we'll have a better understanding of grade and profile and performance commissioning times and all that sort of stuff, right? Because obviously you produce 20,000 ounces difference mm. at a $1,000 margin, should be more, but a $1,000 margin, there's 20 million bucks swing. That's important on a company of our size. So we'll have a picture for that. The building of a plant expansion to go to normally 1.5 million tonnes per annum from the 1, 1.1 1 that we do at the moment and the moving of the road, is about a year. So we want to be kicking in that in decision before the end of this year and spending the money in 2025. We want to be, at the end of 2025, we want to be running 1.5 million tonnes per annum or more on oxide through that mill, putting as much Roswell material we can in as possible because it's higher grade versus the open cut because then obviously in open cut you get more ounces but lower grades. <clears throat> um, you know, stockpiling material where it is and doing north of 100,000 ounces. Mm. And there's every reason why we should be doing that and every ounce we have drives our cost down. And there's every reason why people should believe you because the company's got such an outstanding track record of under-promising and over-delivering on everything that you've been able to do over the year. Yeah, yeah. The, the one thing that it's been difficult to update shareholders on because we haven't known ourselves is the exact capital pathway forward, right? But we'll know all of that by the middle of this year. Right. But in terms of, you know, production, cost, drilling, yeah, we pretty much do what exactly what we've said or better. Yeah. And so, you know, and so, you know, when you ruminate on that, if you say in a year and a half's time, we're going to be at 100,000 100, ounces or above, so that's 2025, we're seven years ahead of us at that rate on an existing mine that's already established and producing. Um, and an ore body that seems to keep giving. An ore body that keeps giving. There are companies with less than that who aren't approved yet and aren't built with higher valuations than us. So I'm I'm optimistic about yeah. our prospects. Well, that's all about selling the dream, I suppose, rather than yeah, I mean, that, that, delivering the reality. Which that is, is one of the things. We, we deliver the reality, yeah. right? And uh, we have been for a long time and... There's elements of dream in what we do, of course. You know, you are not in junior mining unless you're yeah. into risk. Stars in your eyes. Well, and, well, because you're chasing a superior return. Yeah. 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 Or else you do something else. Well, that's good. So that's, I mean, that's, that's Tommy though. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a medium scale, um, profitable gold profitable operation. business that we're hoping we will bring more to people's attention and light. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But the growth project in the bigger picture yeah, beyond of the that, company yeah. is, is Boda Kaiser that I mentioned briefly at, mm. in the introduction. That was a, a, a project, well, it's a discovery that you made 
2019. 2019, okay. Yeah. And you've brought it a hell of a long way. I mean, the um, the project or the, the two um, deposits now stand collectively at 15.7 million ounces um, of gold equivalent in gold and copper. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, it's another example of, as I, as I mentioned earlier, Alkane's um, geotechnical, geoscience work, mm. um, delivering the goods for the company and its shareholders. How did you find it how, and, and how do you feel um, this project might compare to some of the other household name yeah. free deposits in New South Wales? Yeah, I mean, de- dealing first with how we found it. So, you know, we've been blessed for many years with a deeply technical geological team, exploration, both exploration and on site, uh, but particularly exploration is led by Ian Chalmers, our technical director, um, and so he's just as involved in that as he's ever been. He's just dropped a lot of the corporate stuff that I'm doing now and organisational, operational stuff. Um, and uh, David Meets, our head of exploration, right, who works directly for them. David has a great team underneath him. And so we acquired those tenements over sort of the course of the late 90s through to the 2000s and the, about the time we commissioned Tommy Lee, which is putting together that tenement package. It's a fairly long incubation period, isn't long it? Long incubation period. And, of course, it wasn't our highest priority, but we did a lot of groundwork, all the normal things. Of course, we put drill holes in. Originally, there was a down, and we ended up dropping this piece of tenement down at um, Bedangra south of where we are. There was a really old copper mine done sort of turn of the century, Second World War stuff, and there's really old remnants of vats there and stuff. Um, no, there's an old um, uh, chimney there. There's remnants of vats up at Kaiser. And we drilled before my time, drilled out of it. Didn't find a cracker, right? So it was a lot about early effort. And then we went in and around Kaiser, which went in now, and we drilled shallow holes at different orientations trying to define the ore body resource. It was already there was sort of a million tonnes of a bit of this and a bit of that, you know, reasonable grades but not a lot of volume. And at the time, our structural understanding just wasn't quite on. And then the government approved a wind farm, the Bedenga wind farm, that interfered, that whilst it was in construction, we did new exploration. Our agreement with them was we'll stay out of the way and you guys do this and we'll come back in and, and, and do it. Um, and got all these defined areas where, where we can and can't go and so you've got pictures of us drilling near turbines and stuff like that. Um, and we didn't drill a lot of holes through that period of construction, which was sort of 16, 17, 18 we got back on the ground in 19. During that time, we had a lot of time to think. We'd done non-intrusive stuff, done a little bit of air core here and there. And Ian and Dave and their team had decided, okay, we're going to try holes in this orientation, slightly different in these locations because we think we might do something. And on the one of the holes, first hole, second hole, they hit um, our original discovery hole, which was you know a couple of hundred metres at plus – 1% copper plus 1 gram gold, mm. and it all grew from there. And then the very best hole we put out, I was actually talking about the company just briefing investors as COVID hit. Okay. Right, exactly as that in, in early, you know, that late February, early March 2020. 2020. And we'd put out a hole, it was something like a kilometre at 0.7 equivalent or something. I can't really remember. And it was like 400 metres at plus one gram or plus one percent or something. It was just phenomenal, right? Yeah. And our share price went down 10% because <laughs> the whole thing was going pear shaped, right? Because everything was hitting the Everything brand. was pear shaped, yeah. <laughs> and so we, you know, we steadily built from that and, um, you know, we have subsequently spent nearly $55 million there drilling that out. So why does a company like Alkane spend that much money? What is the size of this prize? And and how does a company like Alkane capture that? What, what, what do we do going forward? Yeah, exactly. So the first thing is nothing's valuable until you know what it's worth, right? And you look at, you know, uh, the grey drilling out Malina or all those other things, right? You've got to understand the size of the deposit first. Um, and in our particular case, because it was a lower grade system, it's got higher grade portions, but a lower grade system. So that resource that you described is at a 0. 0.5 something, 0. 0.55, 0. 0.56 equivalent grade, right? Um, 
grams per ton great. Grams per ton great. You need a really big volume for that. And so we, we drilled that out. Also, we were looking for higher grade portions because they'll really shift the economics and they'll influence how you start. But the main thing about it is these projects of this scale, so Cadia started with a higher grade in an open cut originally, but if you look at in real terms of its grade versus this grade, they're, they're similar, right? in terms of real dollar terms when you look at prices and all that sort of stuff. And then they found other stuff nearby. So these things have the potential to be 20, 30 years producing in ounce equivalent terms, 300, 400, 500,000 ounce equivalent. Like they can be mega mines, right? Mm. Now obviously, that requires a lot of other stuff. It requires all the good fortune geologically, but it requires the infrastructure of the people. You know, I'm mm. not pretending none of that's occurred. That all start geologically. <laughs> And we ourselves have been generating cash at Tommingley. And so we're saying to ourselves, what do we do with this money? We think that these type of deposits, we're entering a cycle where people will want them. We're seeing them developed in South America. And it depends how comfortable different people are with different things. So certainly investments going to Ecuador at the moment. I mean, North Parks is sort of changing hands as well. North Parks is changing hands. Evolution picked that up. North Parks is a different style of porphyry. They have these pencil porphyries that are higher grades. Um, But once they're established, they once you paid for your capital, these things can make a lot of money. And so, you know, the net present value potentially of a three hundred thousand ounce equivalent, where you're producing stuff at even fifteen hundred bucks an ounce, so it should be more than that. You know, you're talking about spinning out four hundred fifty million bucks worth of cash a year at today's gold prices, right? For decades, for decades. So obviously. You know, they're worth several billion dollars. I'm not saying that's what Boda's worth now, but it's that prize that we're chasing. And we wanted, we felt that prudent, we felt that how do you articulate what most that value could be? You need a resource. You need portions of that resource to be indicated so people understand it's possible to start it. You need metallurgy done. You need an understanding of the regulatory environment, which of course we've got in spades. And you need a costing of what a plant might be. Just so people wrap their heads around it, right? So we have an indicator resource now around Boda. We'll have an indicator resource in Kaiser within weeks from now. We'll then start running mine plans on that. We've already got the metallurgy completed for the appropriate for this stage. We've got prices coming in for first stage, you know, what, what might a plant look like at different run rates, what might it look like 10 million tonnes per annum, what might it look like 20 million tonnes per annum, because obviously in a massive deposit, the harder you run it, the better the economics. So then economically, and then there's still all the regulatory stuff to go, people will be able to say, oh, yeah, I get these guys or someone could build a plant like this for about this. And then it's a matter of people understanding whether those economics are worth it, how do they fit in against other deposits so and what attract money. For the market, those those economics will be wrapped into a scoping study. Yeah, we'll put out a scoping study, yeah. I imagine that'll go out late April probably. Okay. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it depends on a lot of stuff coming in and mine plans and optimizations and blah, 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 blah. But, yeah, absolutely. And then... Then we set about, what what do we do then? Two things. The first one is we set about seeing are there large, depending on the style of execution, because one of the things is build a massive plant, like 20 million tonnes per annum or something, right? Are there partners who might want to do that? So it's not yet at the stage of a Gruyere where it could go and, you know, Goldfields could come in because that was an approved project, right, in terms of regulatory approvals. Um, so it's attracting a partner that's comfortable with the regulatory regime where it's where it sits because they may or may not handle it differently to us. Uh, but in the whole background, we start the environmental approvals process. And that starts not with filling up heaps of paperwork. It starts with collecting data, like what exactly is the farmland there? What exactly is the heritage issues there? Where will the water come from? Where are possibilities of where you might put a tailing stamp? How might that sit? You know, we'll have rough costings for that, but it'll be a generic dam without a location decided, right? So all of those things are important to overcome, and anybody who owns it's going to want to know that. Yeah. And we will spend, you've got to collect two years of baseline data to we can put in 
at least, if we can put in an approval process in New South Wales. We'll get around doing all of that. Do that now. Measure wind. Yeah, do it all. We've started some of that, but we'll, we'll, we'll tie a nice bow on that. And then depending on the economic climate, we would, you know, two, three years' time, put in an environmental application. We're already get, pretty engaged with landholders and all that sort of stuff we, about how we go about acquiring farms and other things that we've done before or come to whatever agreement's necessary. So... But so in the meantime, they, we also look for are there other people that want to come in on this action yeah. and is is their interest something that we think will bring value to Alcane shareholders versus just running it solo? Yeah. So the money that's been spent, and I think you mentioned around $55 million yeah. on the expiration, that'll probably ta- taper off a little bit. Oh, absolutely. You, we'll, we'll, you, we're moving our overall expiration spent around, across the group, to around the $5 million a year mark going forward. Okay. Because if you think about it, Tom and Lee's all streams ahead. We're doing regional stuff to the north and south on that, like right back to air core programs and soils. Ditto, Boda. So we, we have some of this going, you know, I've detailed that in some of our presentations, but we have some of this going as well. We're going right back to Greenfield's stuff, and that includes some RC holes, the odd diamond hole, throughout our broader tenement base as well, because we're looking for, of course, repeat structures, equipment things, and we're taking all the knowledge we've got around targeting and carrying that on to our new targets. And as well as that, we have other tenements like Down Pass Lake Cow, what we call the Southern Junie Porphyry. We're going right back to absolute grassroots first stage stuff on that. So that's why our spend is lower. Of course, if we drilled another Boda hole, you know, um, 15K to the northwest of Boda, absolutely we'd go to the board and we'd say, we'd go to the board and say, what are we going to do? Let's get amongst it, right? Because that's who we are and that's how we think we create value of shareholders. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, I think we've covered, you know, the, the, the Tommingley asset, which yeah. has, has really delivered the company so much value yeah. in your time in the business. Yeah. Um, the Boda Kaiser story is emerging and looks like it, you know, it really is going to be a world class. Yeah, yeah. And sorry, I know you're concluding, but just to cut you no, off, go right? on. you see people do tables of, you know, what are the top X gold deposits in Australia? They don't put Boda Kaiser on it. But on an equivalent basis, Boda Kaiser would be like number three or four. Wow. So it would be bigger than Boddington's contained now because Boddington's got nearly 15 million ounces left. Yeah. Right? So it's one of the top five. Certainly. On an equivalent than, basis. Yeah. Bigger right? than DeGray. Bigger than DeGray. Lower grade, right? So this is a 0.57 equivalent versus, you know, I think Malinor, they've got like 1.4 or one, mm. something like that. Um, but obviously, we'd be looking to mine at higher grades than that, but that will come out in the scoping studies. But even if you do gold content alone, it's like seven to eight million ounces. That puts it in the top 10. Yeah. On gold alone, that. right? You now, people will all say, well, it's big and you've got this and it's lower grade and whatever, but there's the, the economies of scale and the automation is what drives these things. And that's what we'll be looking to demonstrate. It is absolutely, we're not. We're not trying to mill, um, you know. I'm not. We're not pretending the project is half a billion tons at two grams a ton. We're not trying to pretend the projects that, but they're incredibly rare. Those mm. projects that's here, right? Mm. Um, however, if you look at it compared to say the grey, the grey the whole sort of everything they got out. But this is absolute vanilla metallurgy. There's nothing complex about what we're looking to do. We're looking to crush, grind, float. Regrind, concentrate, ship the concentrate, take the cleaner towel, pour some Dora out of it. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Salable. So that's really simple. Yeah. So, but you look, mate, you won't even see us on people's comp charts. So, obviously, that's my job is to change that perception. But what I can't change is people not doing their homework. And that's where hopefully some of our listeners are doing their homework and finding value in what we're doing. I reckon I, I reckon they will be. Yeah, and, and if if they've taken the time to get this far through the podcast, through the podcast, then, they'll just turn the pitch. That's right. Get on then, board. Then I, I I reckon they've they're already invested enough to do some more reading and and potentially go and invest in Alcane. So 
Mate, that was brilliant. You, you, you came here on your little scooter. It's, it's, you, you've yep. tolerated a, a 40 degree heat beating down on your That's back right. as you arrived. I'm sunburned just by talking about the sun, <laughs> showing my Irish heritage. <laughs> but uh, that, was, that was a great chat, and I think you articulate the story really well. And, you know, this company's been around for nigh on 43, four years. We're one of the longest listed mining I'm, companies I'm, in the ASX. Yeah. I, I can't believe it hasn't been taken over yet. Maybe that's something that you've. Well, you know, people worried that we're going to get rolled up, you know, like, um, you know, management, uh, including our chairman, who's a big part of this, control more than 20%, right? So if someone makes us an offer, it's going to have to be a good one. Yeah. That's great. All right, mate. Thank you, Nick. Thanks, mate. Have a great chat. Cheers.